hanum ini gue i final ofonya i hanum i live in paradise The largest and southernmost island in the Marianas archipelago, Guahan is dotted with lush palm trees and miles and miles of soft white sand, surrounded by turquoise waters of the Pacific Ocean. But our paradise has a toxic legacy. Guam shares a history of contamination with many U.S. and overseas military-based communities. It's common knowledge that the U.S. military uses highly toxic substances, and we're experiencing contamination of our lands and waters with Agent Orange, PFAS, PCBs, petroleum fuels, heavy metals, volatile organic compounds, all the military wartime cocktails you can imagine from being carpet bombed during World War II. We're an island that has been referred to by veterans as one big super fun site. A history of military dumping impacts the health of many families here on our 212 square mile island. It only takes two hours to drive from one end to the other. That's how small we are, and we're inundated with environmental contamination. In this episode, I'm sharing real stories of community members whose homes were located by known military toxic dump sites and how their families are among countless others in the community suffering from clusters of rare cancers and chronic illness. While it's difficult to definitively connect their health issues with the environment, the correlation is enough for them to question why their family members are dying. Dr. Lisa Natividad, a professor at University of Guam and primary convener of the Guahan Coalition for Peace and Justice, sat down with me and shared just how much this toxic legacy left by the U.S. military affects us today. When we talk about uh, the impact of militarization on the health of Chamorros, of us as an indigenous population, um, then we see that the toxicity that comes from military activities, from war preparation, military exercises, uh, it really is manifested in our physical bodies. And we see this in cancer rates, for example. And so uh, one such uh, evidence of this is a study that was done by Naval and Haddock, um, which was published in 1997. And in their study, what they did was they looked and surveyed a 25-year period of cancer death certificates. And so in looking at those death certificates, they identified um, and, you know, computed what was the incidence of, of death, of cancer um, on Guahan. And they were able to establish that Chamorros were the highest risk for cancer and that uh, the incidence of cancer was increasing. And this is after they used different calculations from the World Health Organization to standardize uh, that across populations. And the third finding, which for me was the most significant, was that they were able to glean in 1997 that the villages of Santa Rita and Jigo were the ones with the highest incidence rates. Um, and they, in their article, particularly uh, point out that those are the villages with the largest military base presence. And so you see this, this um, Um, congruency uh, in terms of military activities and the very direct impact on the bodies of Chamorros. I met up with Rudy Paco, mayor of municipality at the heart of Guam called Mangmang Totumaiti, where he was born and raised. This municipality is commonly known as MTM, and MTM is home of the largest wetland area in Guam called the Haganya Swamp. More than 70 years ago, Runoff from a Navy-operated power plant in Mengmeng drained into a portion of the Agania Swamp, contaminating the residential area with polychlorinated biphenyls, or PCBs, which are industrial chemicals linked to cancer. Runoff from the power plant would drain into the yard of Paco's childhood home. This is the drain for the power plant. So the drain is clogged up, so where is the water going to flow? It's going to overflow and go down to the residence. This area was where we used to just remove the oil on top of the water just to catch those little fishes. Because back then, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have these up-to-date games. It was a ponding area. 
So this drain goes out and it goes down to the old store, which was Blanco. In the 1990s, Paco challenged the federal government to test for PCBs, not only on the swamp and surrounding soil, but on residents whose health may have been affected by the chemicals. But all I asked the federal government was to do a physical for the community of MTM at least every quarter, but that never happened. There's a family right over there in that house. Every one of them knows and trope cancer. And look at where they live, right across from the parking. I met up with Inez Asuika Lujan, who grew up in the home directly across the Navy power plant. She and five of her siblings battled nasal pharyngeal cancer. Tragically, all five passed away of cancer, and she is the sole cancer survivor. This is where we grew up before I carried, died from carrying. And the power plant is right across. There used to be a fan cyclone wire here for their gate. Joined by her granddaughter, Inez Perez, we went to the nearby swamp area where Inez Lujan would spend her days playing with her siblings. Back then, when my dad was around, there's trails. Uh, not that it's old like this. There are trails that we, we go down into the swamp area. And he got so many plantations, you know, pineapple, uh, sugar cane, watermelon, a lot of fruit, baby, peanut. My dad really is a good farmer. He works regular job to raise 13 kids. We used to enjoy uh, fishing with my dad. We, we also have fun playing in the water, you know. Yeah. When we were young, also we, we go to the swamp. My dad would cut this uh, can of uh, uh, Navy biscuit and, and we go down there and we put it in the mud. And we put our hands inside, we catch cactus. Oh man, they're huge and they're very good to eat too. Yeah, we do. We, we do those things. Yeah. We, you know, of course, we have to be careful. He's going to poke us. <laughs> but we, we, we weren't scared. <laughs> My dad fished, you know, but we found him. Yeah, he's around us. It was good. We enjoyed that, those days. Growing up, uh, a lot of plantations. Too. My dad plant there in the swamp area. And we eat a lot of those food. We call it our swamp area in the ranch where my dad uh, plants and farms also for us. And same way with my grandma, her, her kids, my mom's brothers and sisters, they live around the area too. They plant, they, you know, they feed their kids also from animals they raise, you know. There's a lot of us that were sick, you know, during those times. How does it feel for you as like the granddaughter knowing that your family has been through this um, contamination? Like it is, is, you know, feeling the effects of that. For me, it's hard because I may not have been directly affected, but I've had to like grow up my whole life. I have these memories watching my grandma like bury her siblings and that hurts. You yeah. know, I have a memory. I think it was Uncle Bong or Uncle Lorky. And I remember just seeing you crying. Oh, yeah. That's my brother, my oldest brother. You know, that makes me sad to watch yeah. it. That's why I asked you, how do you, like, are you sad when you lose your siblings? Oh, yeah. Definitely. I always ask her that. Because oh, yeah. I'm just curious. And she's like, yeah. 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 And it's just what like, yeah. losing losing family members is part of yeah. life. Like I, my, feel, I feel like they could have had more years on this earth. Yeah, like my baby brother, Thuya. Yeah. Thuya, my brother. Um, when he had his uh, cancer from nasal pharyngeal, and then he was a little bit uh, you know, better than it rolled, the cancer rolled to his bone. That's what killed him. Yeah. I'm very fortunate. I thank the Lord. 
I'm still around uh, with a lot also of my uh, exercises and I get away from the <laughs> That's you awesome. Know, like, I really? feel selfish too because I'm thankful that yeah. my grandma was the one that survived. Out yeah. of, like, how many, how many relatives did you lose? There were five of our siblings. Uh, and then your mom. Um, yeah, my mom, my dad, then my mom, then my oldest sister, then my youngest brother, then uh, my second youngest brother, then it went to my oldest brother, then my uh, down my middle sister, then now my baby sister just passed away. Um, she did have cancer too. Just that in August of this year. And she also has nasal pharyngeal cancer. A lot of my mom's brother died before uh, about the ages of 50, 51. And then my sister, my oldest sister, uh, she had a nasal pharyngeal cancer too. And she had a five set of treatment, but she never really got out of it. And then about four years later, I I had the exact uh, nasal pharyngeal cancer. So she was treated in Hawaii, same as me. Uh, when I went in 1997, our doctor was saying that there is no true cancer. It's not heredity, in other words. Something uh, is not right where there is uh, two exact cancer in the same family for what's going on around the area, which is all these uh, contaminations, you know, the swamp, uh, my dad fish, and we eat the fish, and he plants, you know, but who knows that back then, right? We, we don't know what, what's going on. There weren't just PCBs in the nearby waters and fjord of Victoria Lola Leon Guerrero's childhood home. Sections of the topsoil at this World War II dump site were found to be contaminated with hazardous levels of mercury, lead, arsenic, pesticides, and PCBs. The property was formerly the location of military supply warehouses, a military vehicle base yard, and a shooting range. The Department of Defense did a partial cleanup and never came back. Oh yeah, see all that metal? See, so this is the metal that we've been just collecting and just collecting. So there's even a, a rusty bayonet, I think, in here. Yeah, some of the metals that are that really belongs to the military. See, these are all. I don't know what all these are. Pipes, stuff looks like for a car. And there's, there might be a couple in there, but you know, I just threw them all in there. <laughs> so, and then every time the bush cutter guys come and they kind of fly all over the place. Yeah. When I was a kid, I would play in this with more jungly, mm -hmm. and I would like play in the jungle, and then I'd find like little pieces of metal, gunpowder, yeah. hand grenade. <laughs> the land that I grew up in Tuatsu is my mother's land, and she inherited it from her mom. Um, and they started living there after World War II. It was land that had belonged to the family and was mostly used for farming before the war. And then after the war, um, both my grandmother and her brother um, built homes in the prop on the property. And um, it wasn't until we had always known that there was uh, military waste from the war buried in the property because when we were kids, we would like be playing in the dirt and there was like gunpowder or like once my brother found a bomb buried in the yard and had to, you know, they had to bring the like bomb squad and everything and it was a big ordeal. But so we had been really aware that the property itself had been used as a dump site after the war. Um, um, but we had never been informed to what extent or what was buried in the property. And so 
In 2008, the Army Corps of Engineers had contracted a team that came and they had asked permission from our family and from my Uncle Ben's family, my grandma's brother and his children to sort of dig it up and, and really study what was there and the degree of contamination that had occurred. And so they did that in 2008. In 2010, they invited our families to um, the Mung Mung Satsumaiti Community Center and had like a public hearing just for our families about what they had found. And so um, it was this like PowerPoint and all bullet points. And they were, you know, basically saying that it had been both the water and the soil had been so heavily contaminated that the mediation they um, suggested was excavation and offsite removal, which was only which only happened in cases where the contamination was so severe. Do you remember those town hall meetings, what that experience was like hearing finally details about the contamination and what was in your property? For me, it was kind of a almost a shock because nobody ever said we never had any cleanup or anything like that when we moved in. Even when they were digging for the house, it was you dug and you built your house and that was it, right? But um, it was kind of scary due to the fact that now I have grandkids and how much pile of dirt do I have to have in the back so that they can be able to play back there? Or how much dirt do I have to put? Uh, good, clean dirt so that I can plant something back there and eat off the land and not get sick because that's not a guarantee for me, you know? So, um, but yeah, it's kind of a shocker, but you know what, what can, I've got the land already. Mm -hmm. and guess who's gonna inherit it? <laughs> my one and only, you know, and so she's, you know, uh, we planned and we planned, but, you know, now I need to, I, I feel that if I'm going to use the other half of the property all the way down towards the mango tree, that I need some really good dirt. Clean dirt. Good, clean dirt, but how much do I need so that it doesn't contaminate the food mm -hmm. that's going to come out of that? I think the thing that's confusing is exactly that. Like the information doesn't tell you well how much was contaminated, and like my mom said, how deep in are yes. those things buried? Yeah. Um, will the water ever be clean? Right? Mm -hmm. Like I think one of the biggest obstacles we all face is a lack of accountability and a lack of information. Mm -hmm. And so I think the first thing for our family is like being fully informed like when we were requesting information about well what do these particular chemicals mean for our health and what are some of the health uh, conditions that are connected to you know this this level of contamination in the water and soil and we were never provided that information but we requested that at the public hearing and via right. email right. <laughs> and i think for us the biggest issue is you know inform the community of how bad you know how badly it's been contaminated and then Mm -hmm. What does that mean for our bodies? What does that mean for our overall health? And then commit to cleaning it up. Don't just abandon it, you know. What they had found in the property was that the soil had levels of lead, PCB, arsenic, and a ton of other chemicals I cannot name. Um, and that even the water had degrees of contamination that were higher than other areas on the island. Um, in the public hearing, there were family members from other parts of Totu and Mung Mung who had come because in their properties, there was military you know, waste that they had found over the years, just like we had. Um, but they were told that the public hearing was only dealing with the um, Monte Cowboy Banas properties um, because we were like, I guess, considered one of the super fun sites. And so any other properties in the village, they weren't even going to investigate, that it wasn't on their list and that um, this was all that they were there to discuss. So like one guy came and was like, you know, I found like tanks buried in my yard, right? And they're like, oh, well, that's, it's not on our list of properties that needed to be uh, cleaned up. So we're, we can't discuss that. I had followed up because um, that very same year, um, I had lost my first child to a rare birth defect uh, called an omphalocell. It's where um, his intestines had formed outside his body in a sac. And so abdominal wall defects um, are pretty rare, but are very common here in Guam. And so um, 
when I had been doing research, you know, into that, just because I was as a mother really trying to understand, like, how did this happen? Um, you know, I had found like a connection. I had found an article, a scientific article linking um, the presence of an umbrella cell or like high incidences of abdominal wall defects in a community that had like rocket fuel in the water. Um, and so I was like, well, if there's like a, I mean, it wasn't, directly called a cause, but there was this correlation, right? So I'm like, could then this environmental contamination have impacted my child? Then they did show up a year later with like a construction crew. Most of the contamination was in my Uncle Ben's property, which is right below my mom's property. And so what they had done was like dug into the soil, like these long rectangles and they had filled like shipping containers full of the soil. Um, and then midway through the project, they ran out of money and they buried everything back and they have not shown up since. So this was around 2011. And now more than 10 years later, they never came to finish the cleanup. So they, you know, they investigated what was there. They informed us what was there. They began the cleanup and then they ran out of money and never finished the job. Um, in my Uncle Ben's family, you know, my Auntie Norma recently died of cancer. I know that, um, you know, a couple of his sons have also had cancer. Um, and, you know, who knows what other health conditions um, may be connected to this. Um, but, you know, a lot of the chemicals on that list are chemicals that are connected to high cancer rates in other communities. Um, but yeah, for me, like growing up, it's like we were never, um, growing up, we didn't drink water from the tap. Like it was just always a given that the water is not safe to drink, period. Whether or not we knew how the land was contaminated, there is always just this way in which I think we're aware as a community of like, the fact that we don't have clean drinking water and that it's a risk to drink the water coming out of our tap. And then when we finally, you know, heard about our specific property, it was confirmed. When I think about what happened to our property and I think about like just this idea that we like built our whole lives on this contaminated land and you know, with no accountability from the Department of Defense or not even like just thinking like there are people who live here. Sometimes I wonder, it's like when you hear about the way Guam is depicted to the rest of the world as this military base, it's like no one ever thinks about the people who actually live here. They only see Guam as a military installation, not as a island nation with such a rich history and families who call this place home and have done so for thousands of years, right? And that is really terrifying to only be seen, to not be seen as a people, because what it means is that our actual health and well being, our lives, they don't matter. The military mission is what matters. The defense of the continental United States is what matters. And what's sacrificed is our own health and well being. I think we need to go back to, back to the table and discuss some more and get invite more families in. Uh, and even if I don't have a major cleanup this way, but test still test the dirt and the ground um, because I'm never going to plant anything in the back. You know, lucky my brother planted tomato, I mean, uh, banana trees and, you know, we planted a lemai tree and people actually all over the village harvest from here. But uh, come back to the table and, and listen to us, but also, get all the other families involved. Sit down and let's talk about it. And don't run out of money. Yeah. You know? Invest in, in yeah. first mm -hmm. figuring out what has been buried, mm -hmm. how is it harming us, and yes. how do we clean it and get it yeah. out of here right? yeah. before more and mm -hmm. more contamination occurs. And we're all getting older now. And it's not me. It's it's her generation and the generation of her children. Mm -hmm. You know, because they're going to inherit this property. PCBs aren't just a problem in MTM. Residents in the southern village of Marizo are still being advised to avoid eating fish from the Cocos Lagoon 
because the level of PCB contamination in sampled fish remains above federal standards for safe consumption. Marito is the closest village to Cocos Island, the former site of a U.S. Coast Guard's long-range navigation, or Lauren Station, from 1944 to 1963. PCBs from electrical equipment used at the Coast Guard's Lauren stations, such as transformers and capacitors, were improperly discarded on Cocos Island and in Cocos Lagoon. In 2005, the Coast Guard removed sources of PCB contamination in and around Cocos Island, but a 2015 follow-up sampling showed some spikes in PCB levels and levels of toxic pesticide DDT in the waters around Cocos Island, including fish. Buenas, so we just took a boat out to, this is Cocos Island, it's right off the coast of Guam. Um, right back there is the village of Malesu. So the military shut down the navigation station in 1965, but we're still feeling the effects of the PCB contamination up until today. These are lasting decades-long impacts of historical contamination done by the U.S. military that our people are still feeling. And a lot of what activists have been saying all these years is that we can't be building up, uh, you know, the, the, the military expansion in this region is called the military buildup. And we can't be building up while we're still trying to clean up. There's so much toxicity still in this area. And so we have to do what we can as a community to continue to raise awareness so that our families are not affected, so that we're not suffering from cancers and other chronic illnesses from the toxicity across our island. One local fisherman says the PCB contamination in the lagoon from the Coast Guard's Loran Station facility has affected his ability to fish and enjoy the waters that were once his playground. Uh, my name is Ron Afaji, uh, Dr. Malesudo. Uh, born and raised there. Uh, we just recently moved up, but my father and all generations before me have all lived in Malesu. We were from there. And... Um, I live in the, the more northern side of Melissa, which is in Bili, in Bili Bay. Um, but we fish there all the time at Cocos Island because that was the safest place. And so, yeah, throughout our livelihood, everything was inside Cocos area. And, we, you know, we, uh, we everything we've, we got was on in Cocos, either in the back side of Cocos or on the front side of Cocos. And when we camp, we camp along the Navy area where they had abandoned it and gave it back to our people. Uh, we, they built a pier there at one time, storm took it away, um, but that was the only spot that we locals were able to go to that we didn't have to pay other than the other side, you know? So fishing was, you know, what we grew up with. We all knew how to fish since we were young. What kind of fishes can you find? We did, we did a lot of spear fishing mostly, you know, and uh, uh, taktaga, uh, hang on down in, on the Navy side, uh, Lagua, uh, um, Satmonete, Mafuti, all these fish that, that, that you'll find in the reef, you know, we're all from that, that area. We, we all grew up there and that's where we all, we'd, we'd go to every time there was a, an outing that we want, we, the whole family wanted to go uh, away from the island. That was the place we went. So we were in that area and a couple of my first cousins who I had left uh, and came, left to the States and came back later on, but they've, they loved fishing and, and I, you know, cancer was a big thing in, in Melissa. My youngest cousin, my cousin at my age at that time in, in his thirties died of cancer. Um, my other cousin who was, was younger than, than uh, his brother, died at the age of 40, he died of cancer. And all that, I think, is because of what they, uh, what, what they left in the ocean for us. And luckily, I didn't make it a, a habit to, to go there all the time, but they did because that was, whenever there was a party, we were sent out to go out and, and do fishing. Uh, all the time, every time, every day. Whenever we needed to, we had to. And that was the place we went to. So I think the military has not done their, their, their due diligence. You know, they've not really helped the people. Um, 
to control what, what is there. I'm sure others feel the same way that the PCB is not, is, is still there and it's affected the fish and, and we think it's affected us. That's our playground. That's, that's what, that's our playground. That's where, if you talk lagoon, you talk fishing spots, that's our playground. That's, we know that by heart, we can close our eyes and get to that site and it's just something we enjoy doing. It's, and sometimes we just do it because we enjoy it. You know, it's just something in our blood, you know? Yeah. Um, not that we need to be asked or told that uh, we need fish for, we just do it because one, this is how we grew up. We, fish was our daily, our daily uh, uh, food on the table, you know, no matter what. I, I, I think the federal government needs to continue to do their part, not just only on the ocean, but also to even assist on our people in the village. Mauricio Mayor Ernest Chargolov says the community has been left in the dark about water quality. We're at a standstill as far as information is concerned. I know they did uh, studies on land. They, they cleared up some of the sand. They took soil samples. On shore, near shore, uh, near shore in, inland, as well as the waters in the middle area and then inside of the lagoon. But those studies and, and whatever uh, scientific uh, uh, things that they were doing in the water were never given uh, to the community as far as the results were and what the findings were. So I think the key to, to anything that you put the, the public at, at, uh, in concern is to give feedback, you know? It's the problem, it's not the follow-up, follow up, but the follow-through, to make sure that, that you're continuously on an ongoing basis. As long as the problem persists, what are we doing? Are we band-aiding the problem? Are we trying to rectify it and set it straight and, and, uh, and just cure the problem? You see, you know, like, don't cure, don't, don't try to cure the symptoms or treat the symptoms, cure the disease. So to me, it's, it's just that when these scientists in collaboration with DPA and uh, Coast Guard, they should collaborate with their information to disseminate the appropriate information so that you make the people knowledgeable of what's going on. And you keep them updated on what your findings are uh, on an ongoing basis. You don't, you don't do the study, conduct the study, and then put it to rest. Don't be like Emerald, you set it and forget it. You, you need to come back and, and on, a, on a regular basis or a periodic basis, come back and give feedback on what your findings are and what, what the status is as far as the PCB is concerned. As a Marizo resident whose family has subsisted off the land and waters of Malesu for generations, Chargolov expressed concern about the health impacts of PCB exposure. I go out there. I go out there to catch crab, land crab, and coconut crab. And I go out there to fish as well. So the fish in and around the area that, that is affected, I catch the fish from there. So I'm, I'm concerned that, uh, you know, I don't know if I, if I may have ingested or those that indulge with the fish that I caught in the area may have ingested it and, and, and it has a bearing on their health. From Chargolov's perspective, the federal government should continue to conduct regular testing and exhaust all remedies to restore the health of the Cocos Lagoon. The responsibility should be on the federal government. They're the ones that created it by bringing all those transformers there. And they should know that you don't dispose of it inappropriately. You're supposed to know how to dispose of, of a PCB containing uh, elements, you know, like the transformers or anything that has toxic materials. You have to discard them and dispose of them accordingly, according to scientific ways of, of disposing them and properly disposing of them. We should exhaust any and all efforts to, to address it to the most minimal, you know? So that because, you know, the investment you put today, our children in the future are gonna reap and harvest. You know I mean? You plant something today, you're not gonna eat the mango that you planted. You may not in your lifetime. But you know, whatever you plant, sometimes you plant those that you can immediately or shortly after plantation after you plant it, you can harvest it and that will be the fruits of your labor. But when you plant something, you expect it to grow and produce. It may not produce in your time of living, it's like insurance. It's not for you. It's for the boss that you leave behind. That's the same thing. When we, whatever we fix today, is something our children don't have to worry about tomorrow. Panu, ooh, ooh, 
Kutsan Zaunagi Menitano Nafan Hudzung Si Habobo Nafan Hudzung Si Hasaduk Zan Matan Hanuk